Uh, I'm Tony Mullen. I'm the uh, chair of the Western School Committee. I'd like to call this meeting of the School Committee to order. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jason from our architect today. The format today is just going to be a set of some presentations and an opportunity for Q&A um, throughout the day, as well as an interactive exercise at the end. Um, and Jason Thomas will have you out here by 8.30. So um, thank you for coming. Um, we really appreciate um, your engagement today. All right. Jason. So there's two basic objectives for this evening. We want to report out on our program process to date, uh, which means. Okay, do I need to be much closer? One of our main, our two main objectives for tonight are to report out on our programming progress, which means we've had a number of meetings about defining the, <laughs> defining the project. Uh, so we're going to share that information with you. We're also going to uh, explore what's changed about education and educational facility. Mike, so we're recording this, so without the microphone, it won't be recorded. Okay. Everybody else is safe. I understand. You just got to put it closer to your chin. I'll, I'll give it one more go. I feel like that guy from Everybody Love for Raymond that touches his chin every time he takes a bite. <laughs> uh, we also want to explore how education and how educational facilities have changed. Just our toe into the water, uh, really, this in our first set of meetings. But we're going to go a little deeper with that this evening. I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll do my best to use my teacher voice, and hopefully the ambient mics will pick it up. And so the agenda for this evening is, for those of you that haven't been to one of these yet, we're going to give you a sense of the overall process and outline some of the basic milestones. We'll report out on our programming efforts. We've had essentially three different kinds of meetings to help define the project uh, with educational folks. We're going to share some information about what a 21st century next generation education looks like and why it's different than when your current buildings were constructed. And then we're going to do the same thing for educational facilities. Share some examples of built projects that embody that idea of uh, next generation education. And then we'll conclude the night with an activity. Uh, you see the images posted around the room. We'll uh, have something where you can provide feedback on what you see so that it may inform the project itself. And then we'll share what our next steps are for the next couple of months. <clears throat> so many of you have seen these graphics before. This dashed line represents this evening. In this first step, the idea is to define and generate a series of options. Uh, we have, I'll talk in just a minute about the three scenarios that we have to explore. And the first step, what's called the preliminary design program, will conclude um, in March, spring of next year, with a short list of options that we'll present to the MSBA. Over the summer, we'll take that short list of options and present uh, uh, to the MSBA a final preferred solution. Then over the course of about a year, um, we'll prepare a schematic design and the funding for the project will happen in the spring of 2021. If all things go according to plan, construction will start and the project will open whatever it turns out to be in the fall of 2023. I mentioned scenarios a few minutes ago. The district and the MSBA has agreed to three basic scenarios uh, centered around different design enrollments. So Hanlon was identified as the priority project. So in all three scenarios, Hanlon has to be involved. So if it were a Hanlon only project, it would be for 315 students. If it were a Hanlon Deerfield consolidation, it would be 560 students. And if it were a Hanlon Sheehan consolidation, it would be 685 students. Those are the parameters that the district and the MSBA has agreed upon. In each one of those, there's a number of different kinds of options that we have to explore. For Hanlon, we would explore renovation only, addition renovation, and new construction <coughs> on the Hanlon site. For a Hanlon Deerfield consolidation, because neither of those facilities are large enough to accommodate that agreed upon enrollment without an addition, we would only be exploring addition renovation and new construction on the Hanlon site. At present, doing this consolidation on the Deerfield site is not being considered. 
Finally, the Hamlin Sheehan uh, consolidation. Similarly, neither one of the two buildings alone is large enough to accommodate the agreed upon enrollment. So we'll be exploring addition renovation and new construction, this time on both of those sites. One version on the uh, Sheehan site, one version on the Hamlin site. As part of this submission that goes in in March, next spring, some evaluation criteria will be applied, and that is what will generate the short list. So here we are, <clears throat> just after the process has started. Um, to develop that full range of options, we explore both facilities and education. And like I said, that full range of options will be developed for a submission next spring that will ultimately result in a short list. As the process moves forward, we continue to look at both education and facilities. We evaluate the short list of options. Ultimately, the district and the town will select a preferred option. Uh, so the idea is that by the end of the school year next year, everyone will know what the preferred solution is. Then we'll move through the schematic design phase, generate more detailed cost estimates, and then at town meeting in the spring of 2021, both town and the MSPA will agree to funding, vote on funding um, the project. So I'll pause right there for those of you who haven't seen that um, to see if there are any questions. So if there's any questions, if you could just state your name and the question, I'll actually repeat the question for, it's for the TV. Are there any questions on the process so far? Sure, go ahead. So let me just repeat. Nigel's question was, well, how did we incorporate the feedback from the prior two um, vision sessions? And, and the answer to that is we haven't incorporated it yet. What we did was um, digested that information from the first round of public forums, and we're about to enter that options development stage. So that's when we'll be folding in what we've heard so far, including not only for the public forums, but all of the programming efforts that we've undertaken so far. And we did um, send out a communication with all the summary as well as all the detail from those two forms. Um, and we've also created a frequently asked question. So that's actually okay. Well, every single thing that somebody contributed, we shared. Okay. No, no further questions? All right. So on the programming side, yes, we're defining uh, a potential building project here, but I think it's fair to say that it's actually much broader than that. On the educational side, this is the opportunity to define an educational vision for the entire elementary district, not just for, um, for the project. So some of the things you'll see up here may ultimately impact other buildings in the district also in some way. So what we've done so far, we had a series of principal interviews and educational walkthroughs where our staff met with all of the buildings um, in the project, walked to see what the existing conditions were from an educational point of view, We've had uh, a full elementary school faculty and staff visioning workshop as part of their professional development day last week. And then just this morning, we had a follow-up principals workshop where we got into a little more detail about individual spaces. So from those walkthroughs, I think one of the things that we observed firsthand for the first time, at least for me, uh, was some of the space deficiencies that these buildings have. I think we're all well-versed in what the Facility conditions are antiquated systems and the like, but from an educational point of view, there are deficiencies in terms of special education, uh, classroom size, breakout space. Uh, in some buildings, there is a dedicated art or music space. And so we saw all of those things firsthand. So this first bullet point is sort of about rectifying all of those spatial deficiencies. Designing a project uh, intentionally to meet the educational program and services that you're delivering rather than forcing them into spaces that were designed for something else. That includes classrooms. For those of you that are familiar with the elementary environment, uh, a contemporary classroom is set up in multiple zones where multiple activities can be going on at one time. So coming out of those interviews, the principals wanted us to know that we needed to design classrooms in that way looking forward. Similarly, the library, not just a repository for books, but something that can accomplish a great many more things. <coughs> Because of the nature of students, um, almost all of the principals expressed this observation that this idea of uh, sensory needs is becoming more and more important. 
paying attention to whether students are sensory seekers or sensory avoiders, and articulating space in the architecture accordingly. Because we're considering consolidation, something that came up at all of the principal interviews was this idea of maintaining relationships. Students should know teachers well. Students should know one another well. You know, whatever the resulting project, it should have a small school feel. And there are architectural strategies that can be employed um, to accomplish that. Flexibility, we heard over and over and over again. And this isn't just flexibility in terms of moving the furniture around, but it's flexibility in the sense of what the second bullet is there on the slide variety of spaces so that um, faculty, staff, and students can uh, change the group size, they can change the activity, they can change the tools and resources um, over the life cycle of the building. You're going to see a couple of slides in a moment where in the mid 20th century schools were designed sort of on the average. What I mean by that is it's one size fits all, right? You figure out what the average student is and that's the same experience for everyone. What we heard was, in the principal's interview, is to, to try not to do that. Instead, express this idea of choice, of different kinds of environments that students could pick from. This idea of play came up over and over again, or exploration, if you think about uh, perhaps going to a children's museum, what that sort of look and feel is, where students are engaging with the building, or engaging with manipulatives, or engaging in some sort of meaningful, uh, authentic learning experience. That's what we mean by student play and exploration as a theme for the project. Safety and security is always paramount. We haven't dug deep into that issue yet, but everybody identified you know, things like the front door, lockdown procedures, compartmentalizing the building. <coughs> Reimagining the student dining experience, um, the room we're in is a cafeteria, and it sort of fits that one size fits all model. It's the same experience for everyone. So when principals are talking about this, they're talking about shaping the student dining experience in a way that you could have um, much quieter experiences or more small group experiences so that it wasn't the same for everyone across the board depending on students' needs. And then I already mentioned the idea of student choice, where they learn, what tools they use, what furniture they use, um, and how they access recess. <coughs> After the principals interviews, like I said, we had this um, professional development day where we had 140 faculty and staff from all of the elementary schools here in Westwood participate in a couple of exercises. Um, we basically had them think about education and the experiences that students should have, and then what kind of facilities were necessary to support that educational vision. And so this is representative of the first activity that we did where they were describing student experience. So what they're doing <coughs> is they documented one student experience on this 8 by 11 sheet of paper where there's a narrative description, they've selected images to represent the experience, and then they actually created these physical models um, of what the experience was sort of in space at the micro scale. So what this one is trying to depict, this is an outside wall, these are windows, the partly cloudy day, um, and what, what they're showing here is these sort of quiet individual reading nooks for um, students to crawl into during the nursing time. And so it's that kind of thing that will ultimately inform the architecture of the project. So this is one um, shot of how, you know, sort of how that day felt. Here's another one of those three-dimensional uh, models. This is actually, um, I laugh at this a little bit, this is trying to represent different furniture heights to give students choice. Um, these students are standing, but they didn't quite coordinate the grade level with the furniture that they specified. Uh, but that's what's happening there is a statement about furniture. You can see that everybody, even though we had a, a large crowd, everybody was fully engaged for the full three hours of kind of them. And then this shot represents the work product of just the first activity. We ended up with something like 71 experiences that were documented. And we're in the process now of digesting all of that and translating it into things like the space summary, and to guiding principles. The second activity we did was around facilities. So in this activity, we gave everyone some tools and some resources to use to document what they thought the right space was for a certain part of the building. So both of these vision boards happen to be classrooms. So you can see in this one, it's one classroom here, the folding partition between another classroom here, 
and two kinds of breakout space, one on this side and a different kind on this side. And part of my favorite thing about this particular um, output is the therapy dog. Uh, this is a similar idea, this is the whole grade level of classrooms. Uh, what they are expressing here is that the shape of the classroom matters. That in order to achieve that idea of having a classroom zone for multiple activities at the same time, that perhaps we need to think about how many corners there are in a classroom. Those tend to be really valuable at the elementary level. So that's what you're seeing here is an L shape with lots of corners where there's some breakout space internal to the building, uh, some larger breakout space for the whole grade level, and then outdoor breakout space. So again, the point of doing these kinds of activities was to inform ultimately the design work. So as we go into options, uh, we will be arranging geometries and looking for opportunities to achieve these, some of these things that came out of the visioning exercises. So here's a, a glimpse of, of those outcomes from this uh, professional development visioning. This isn't a comprehensive list, we just wanted to give you a flavor of what some of the outcomes were. So that idea of a space variety manifested itself as classroom pairs with small group rooms between them. We've already talked about supporting multiple activities. We've already talked about flexibility. We've talked a little bit about breakout space. This is the children's museum sort of experience that we talked about. We saw an awful lot of groups um, where they leveraged um, pegs on the wall or a sensory path or some sort of movement activity. One group had something called the fuzzy hill, which was this you know carpeted mound in the middle of the breakout space where students could have a movement break inside the building that wasn't recess. And so all of those things we sort of grouped together in this sort of children's museum-like experience. Designing special education spaces intentionally rather than accidentally. In most of your buildings right now, it's just things that were classroom spaces or were offices or were other things um, now being used as special education space. And then like you saw in the one drawing, the idea of making sure we have access to the outdoors and designing the landscape in such a way to be used as a learning tool, not just as something to look at. And then some global things that are informing our planning. So with the three scenarios at the top, based on class size targets for the district, MSBA guidelines, it looks like the Hamlin only we would be talking about three sections per grade level. So three kindergartens, three first grades, and so on. For the Hamlin Deerfield, consolidation would be five sections per grade, and for Hamlin Sheehan it would be six sections per grade. In terms of special education programs, we've already learned that there may be a desire to relocate some of the programs from where they currently reside in the district to the project, depending on which scenario we're talking about. None of that's been finalized yet, it's an ongoing discussion, but we wanted to alert folks that that's being talked about. And then finally, these two uh, sort of more global planning principles, the idea of grade level clusters, that um, all of kindergarten is located geographically together with some shared breakout space of some kind. First grade located together, rather than one classroom over there and another kindergarten classroom over there to try to create a cohesiveness uh, around those grade level teams. And then finally, because of safety and security and a number of operational considerations, the idea of zoning the building, the project, into public and private. It's actually um, was something that just came up again this morning. So you might choose, for example, to have the gym and the cafeteria, uh, perhaps the music rooms, in the public room that could be accessible to members of the community after hours and secure the entire rest of the building. Classrooms, maybe the library, special education spaces maybe on, their, on that private side where when the building is open, you know, it's easy to access them, but again, can be secured in an after hours uh, or a crisis situation. So again, that was a lot of uh, information in a very short time window. We'll pause here again for questions on the programming update today. Are there any questions? Yes. Given that up until now, uh, the focus has been on three schools in 
help you bridge that. Sort of how you're seeing this as a system where you're thinking in schools and what will happen to the one or two schools not included in the new building. So the, the question is, um, thank you for the question. The question is, what will happen? That you were looking at three schools, but actually, the, well, all the scenarios will only include one or two. What do we do about the other one or two? Um, Superintendent? Thanks. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that it's really important to us that we have an educational vision for elementary education across the district. And it's important to us that um, teaching and learning in all five elementary schools is aligned to that vision, right? We, we look for alignment in terms of curriculum and instruction. Um, and that's part of the reason why for our full day PD this past week, we didn't just say would the teachers from Hamlin, Deerfield, and um, Sheehan attend. We had everybody in the room and we mixed up those groups because they all need to be talking together as colleagues about what vision is. So that's pretty much on our minds. Having said that, we do with the building project have an opportunity to design specifically to that vision and I think it would be a shame to not take that opportunity to, um, to design to that, to that vision. And what we're finding is that there may be some things that come out that we think we could apply to Downey and Martha Jones, which are buildings that were obviously, um, they were renovated much more recently than the buildings that we're talking about, right? Martha Jones and Downey were fully renovated in the early 2000s. So I think it's safe to say that the space there is much closer to that vision at this point than our 1950s buildings. And if, I, if I could just add to that, um, there may be low-hanging fruit that comes out of the work for the project that could be applied to the building that's not included in the project and the other elementary schools, like furniture, like breakout space. You could find ways to carve those things out without doing any construction work by purchasing some targeted furniture or changing the student dining experience in some way. And so we're I think we're all hopeful, the district included, that that's exactly what happens, is that the lessons that are coming out of the planning for the project could be applied in, in some way to the rest of the elementary schools in the district. So I have a question here. Hi, Christmas. Anyway, um, I'm guessing from Wentworth Street. So in terms of the layout and some of the that work, I mean, it seems great, right? It seems like, you know, it's modern and everything. Do you have any data to kind of support that you actually facilitate and actually, you know, support the learning process? I mean, for me, it's, you know, I, I go to those uh, museums and such, and it just seems to me, maybe I'm old school, but it seems like it's very overwhelming with, like, things and, you know, walls, corners, and so many things. Do you guys have any, I mean, I'm not in this field. Is there anything that says, yes, these would enhance the educational process? So let me just repeat. So Hugh's question was, is there any, you know, any data that shows that educational outcomes are helped by kind of some of the new space? Kind of the, the, exactly. Yeah. Like these intricate things, yeah, that's being... You want to talk yeah, about Jason? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. I'll, I'll alert you to two studies. One is by the Michelle Mahoney Group out of California, and they did a study on um, well-designed facilities in general with a particular focus on daylighting, and their outcomes were that student performance on things like standardized tests, um, attendance, um, how they feel about going to school went up by as much as 20% um, in buildings that were well designed versus buildings that were um, older. Um, another study out of Great Britain just recently in 2018 by um, a gentleman uh, named James Barrett indicated that the year-to-year -year learning outcomes, the differences between students in places where the facility was well thought out and not well thought out, or in alignment with the educational mission, the difference was 16%. So in other words, um, if you've got two students who are taking the same curriculum with the same teachers, if the only thing is different is the facility, then um, the difference in learning could be as much as 16%. So those two studies alone show that there is a tangible impact by a facility. Obviously, the adults in the space um, are the most significant contributor to learning outcomes, but the facility does matter. So you know things like shaping space specifically for special education can have a profound impact on those students where they're in accidental spaces or spaces that were designed for some other function right now. So there is a lot of that tangible evidence out there. But, but like I guess on the counter argument, let's just say you know you can have many 
corners of bending stuff like that. That would be beneficial to kids that might have certain types of disabilities. But what about, you know, maybe how would that, I guess, impact the students that you know, probably move kind of like open space as opposed to like open bends? I don't know, just using that as an example. Well, I, guess I, have, I, mean, like, I think the idea here is to design with enough variety that we're accommodating the needs of all children. Uh, we want to be careful not to over design and make an exactly. environment too exactly. stimulating. Right? We know that for even regularly developing children, something that's um, too stimulating can be distracting, can actually be counterproductive. But in terms of the type of space and the variety of space, I think one of the key things that we've learned over the last you know, 20 years or so is that we need a much wider variety of spaces than we did, uh, than we thought we did in the 20th century. Where you know the basic arithmetic was how many kids do you have? Divide that by 30, and that's how many classroom rectangles you have. Add a gym, add a cafeteria, and you're done. Right? We're thinking about it in a much more sophisticated way. Great, Eric, you have a question? Yeah, yeah thanks, Eric. On the Dover Road, um, as you're talking about the way uh, students grew by age, I'm wondering, um, it has there been, been any thought? And I'm not advocating this. I'm sort of curious about the districts thinking about. Would you ever go to a K to a two situation, three to five? I mean, we're in a K to five, which makes sense to me, but as you're describing all this, I suddenly started wondering if that's been ever thought about why would we or wouldn't we, and just knowing that we that reason. So the question is, would we consider, or have we considered going from the K to five model to kind of potentially a K to two and three to five, superintendent? A question for you. Sure. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is yes. We thought about that. Um, and in fact, Westwood at one point did have K to two schools and three to five schools, and then we redistricted and transitioned to K to five sometime in the, I want to say, late 90s, somewhere in there. And we did think about it again in terms of this project. Um, there are pros and cons to either models. So, for example, I don't know. Is this operator error? Okay. Um, you know, when we think about things like curriculum and curriculum alignment, there is um, some advantage to being horizontally aligned across a grade level by having everybody in the school in one place. But we're also trying to think of a vertical experience, sort of a guaranteed experience as kids progress through the schools. Um, you know, and those two different models are one thing over another. At this point, I think where we've come down is we see benefits and advantages to both. And it would be less disruptive, we feel, in this process to stick with the current model. Any other questions? Yes. I do a summit from Ivy Street. I'm curious about the three scenarios that you've presented. I'm a Sheehan parent, and Sheehan's in one scenario. So, what's the plan for the schools that are in the um, ideal outcome setting? So, Sheehan's up there in one of the three. So, I would say my child has a 33% chance of having a school setting for the school state. What's the plan for the schools that aren't? So the short answer is that we don't have the answer to that question yet, and we are at the very beginning of this feasibility study process. I think that um, a strong out of the original form was just that question that people would like to know. Um, they want to make sure that the school committee in the district has a plan for what will happen with the third remaining building. And so that is something that we are thinking about right now. And we hope that by the time we, so first through the feasibility study for the MSBA project, and then by the time we get to town meeting next year, we would want to be able to tell people, and here is what the plan and the timeline for moving forward is for the remaining building. Thank you. Any other remaining questions? Okay. Oh, yeah, Charlie. Fields that would be useful across soccer and all that. 
and as a part of that is a part of the planning process to find new fields to replace that. And then the issue of uh, environmental learning and uh, all of that. We have Hale Reservation as a wonderful resource. We're beginning to use it, but uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be creative about how how do you take advantage of that in the learning process where the kids are out learning and taking advantage of that resource as a part of the curriculum. Yeah, so the question, there were two parts. The uh, one was around the recreation implications or incorporating the recreation implications in the design. The other was around um, leveraging hail. I can probably speak a little bit of the recreation. I think obviously um, what we, you know, I know there's been some requests, we'll be looking, we haven't decided on anything, but that will obviously be part of looking at the overall project, both in gym and potential fields and working with the rec department on that. As far as hail, I think, Again, that's probably an early conversation, but obviously continue to love the leverage relationship with Hale, but that's kind of early conversations on that. So thank you. Okay. I, I, I would add to that, so let me take those three things in turn. As far as the gymnasium goes, for good or bad, the MSBA has guidelines specifically around gyms. And for the elementary level, it's a 6,000 square foot gym, to put that in context. It's large enough for a high school competition court and the appropriate runoff space but no bleachers. So as recently as this morning, we talked about, does the project want to upsize that so that it's both a high school competition court and enough room for some bleachers so that it can also serve things like youth basketball or as a community uh, asset in town. Anything over that MSBA guideline will be deemed ineligible for reimbursement, but the MSBA has recently changed their policy related to that, where in the past they could say, no, not even if you want to pay for it on your own. They've softened that now, where you can do uh, a larger gymnasium at the elementary level, just that any overage would be ineligible for reimbursement. So we are exploring the possibility of the gym as a community asset already. In terms of play fields, um, historically what happens when you have an existing building on an existing site is if you put the new building on what are currently fields, you would do a swappage of, of use. So you would create, rep, you would replicate fields where the current building is. And if we take Hamlin as an example, there's enough real estate there, it appears there's enough real estate there to accomplish that kind of move. But we're not just programming for the inside of the building, we're also programming for the outside of the building related to fields and parking, <coughs> all of those, to your third point, outdoor learning communities. So yes, we can take better advantage of, of hail, but we're also looking at how we leverage the site where the building is as an outdoor learning opportunity as well. So we're going to have one more chance for Q&A. Go to the next part of the presentation and then one more chance. So we get asked the question, I characterize this as when my high school math teacher used to ask me, why do I need to know this? We get asked all the time, why is a building different? Why is education different than it was in the mid-1950s when you know, your current buildings were, were constructed. So we want to spend a few minutes talking about that. <clears throat> and so to couch that, to, to start that discussion, I'd be interested in hearing from you, what do you think has changed about education in the last, you know, 70 years? Anybody want to volunteer? Technology? Technology for sure. I mentioned a couple of them already. The how we organize classroom space. The idea of special education didn't exist. Classroom sizes and student teacher ratios? Yeah, have all. Classroom sizes generally gotten bigger. Um, students per class have uh, generally gotten smaller. What else has changed? Okay, groups and teams. Right. Specialists. Specialists? Yeah. yeah so far more adults involved in the education experience now than there was in 1950. So I've got a couple of images here. Um, this, this is a postcard that was generated for the 1899 World's Fair. A group of artists was asked to speculate about what the future would look like 100 years <coughs> into the future. And so this is one of them. And they got it not too far off, right? Just here in Massachusetts, we've got iRobot who's doing you know, our sweeping for us. But this was the vision of education 100 years into the future. What do, you, what do you see in this image? What does this say about learning? Individualized. Individualized? 
What else do you see? In, okay. Yeah. By yourself. The teacher's not teaching. But they are in control of all of the information. Right? It's a one directional discussion. Same experience for everybody. Same experience for well, not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that poor guy's left out. He's got to turn the machine. What else do you see? It's only boys. No more reading. It's passive. Right? It's not active in any way. No pen and paper. Right? It's technology rich. Right? Relying on technology. What about this? This is an elementary class at the turn of the century. Right? Again, it's the same experience for everyone. We have some girls at least in this one. Right? Teachers providing individualized instruction as she can get around to everyone. Yeah. What about this? When do you think this picture was taken? 1952. Right, this very well could be Deerfield. Right? Um, again, same experience for everyone. What about this? This is actually the early 2010s, but what's it say about learning? It's changed. How? You guys are laying down instead of sitting around. <laughs> okay. The, bo the body positioning has, has changed. It's a flexible space. A lot more flexible, right? A lot more variety in that, even in that one space. More choice for students. Kids are working on their own. I'm sorry? The students are working on their own. Some are, some are, some are. Right, so, some are engaged in individual activities, it's others are in great right? right? Teachers way over here. How about this? <coughs> More sensory related. Right, this is one of those sensory paths we talked about um, earlier coming out of the programming efforts. This too, right, to move an activity, make board. Very different than those early images that we saw. And so here lies the basic challenge. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Carl Fish. He wrote a book titled Shift <coughs> Happens, and he made this statement, right? That you know, we're essentially designing for a completely unknown future. When your current buildings were designed, the future was fairly well known. Right? Everybody was going to get you know, a job. They knew what the jobs were. They were designing for the average. That's no longer the case. And to design that way, there are essentially three legs of the stool that we have to think about, and they've all changed since your buildings were constructed. When your buildings were constructed, this was the mindset. I feel really sorry for that guy. Right? Focus on standardized testing. Even. But what we know in reality is that every student, every learner is unique. And I think that's what we're hearing coming out of visioning and all of our programming efforts already is this idea of direct, designing to meet individual students where they are, to have enough variety that we can meet all students' needs, not just the average students' needs. To design in a way that emphasizes active learning over passive learning. This diagram is from the National Training Laboratory, some research they did around retention rates. And what they found was the more active the activity, the higher the retention rate. And so in those early images where it was just lecture or it was individual reading, the retention rates are far lower than if students are doing the work actively. <coughs> this is an old observation, right? Maria Montessori, early 20th century. But school buildings weren't designed with this idea in mind until you know, the early 2000s. So we're paying attention to movement in a much more significant way than when your current buildings were constructed. And then the social emotional learning. This is an aspect of education that used to take place on the playground or on the athletic field or in the neighborhood when, students, when children were playing with each other uh, on the sidewalk. 
we're now paying attention to this in a much more intentional way as part of the formal curriculum, and it has space implications. So this is a summary of those things that we've seen uh, change over the last half century or so. Because of technology, the focus on facts and memorization has transitioned to learning how to learn, identifying what's good information and what's not good information, shifting from a one-size-fits-all model to a tailor the educational experience to be individualized for every student. Recognizing that content isn't this sort of series of isolated box cards, but in the real world, all of that content is interrelated. And how do we leverage that as part of the educational experiences um, in an authentic way? And so these are some images that um, we showed at the professional development that sort of embody that idea. If you have space out in the hallway that is designed with intention, right, students can carve out a spot for individual reading, or they can do some fine motor work, uh, or they can work with a, a teacher aide in small groups, that they can do hands-on activities in a number of different places, that we can incorporate technology in a ubiquitous way and give students flexibility of where they learn. And like I said, that uh, we leverage the outdoors uh, for learning experiences. So there's a lot of ways that education, and it, <coughs> as we'll talk about in just a minute, educational facilities have changed since um, the elementary schools in, in Westwood were constructed. So again, we'll pause. Any questions about that sort of educational background? We all have master's degrees in education now. Okay. okay. So the last bit um, is I want to talk about, I'll give you some examples of facilities themselves. So this diagram is by Fielding there. They're a group out of um, Minnesota. And that idea of variety and flexibility, um, they've embodied in just one classroom experience. So what you're looking at is a floor plan diagram where they've said, all right, there's a direct instructional area, there's a teacher area, there's sort of a breakout spot, a wet spot, and access to the outdoors all in one environment. What we shared with the people of the Professional Development Day is that if we were to try to do this for every single classroom in the project, we could never afford it. So how do we create these same experiences but have some of them be shared? So the first example we'll share is, a, is an elementary school out in uh, Virginia. And here you can see in a classroom experience some of those things that Fielding Mayor showed in that diagram that we've already talked about. All of the furniture is highly flexible. The tables are on wheels, the chairs, some of them are on wheels, some of them are on sliders, so the students can move these things for themselves. So there's a tabletop environment, there's a soft seating environment, there's a lot of vertical display surface, and in this particular case, the divider between two classrooms can disappear and look like that. So that's a demonstration of flexibility so that they can change the group size as they desire. And you can see on the other end of the classroom, there's one in the foreground also, the opportunity for a wet. This is that same elementary school where you're seeing um, intentional breakout space, not in the classroom, but just across the corridor. This is part of the library experience there with expansive views of the outside to bring that nature into the experience. Same architect, different project. We put this illustration in the package to demonstrate what another flavor of breakout space might be. So again, here's two classrooms. They happen to be connected by a door between them, but this is a small group space between each between each pair of classrooms. And then you see that inside the classroom itself is a wide variety of experiences. Here's a, a reading area out on the floor. This is a, a window seat for individual reading. There's another one over there. And then this is a breakout space just outside of the classroom. This is what the inside of that room looks like. Yes? Maybe. So, uh, so is, this, is this a singular classroom for this, 18 kids or? This is, this is a pair of classrooms for approximately 18 to 23 kids in each half. 
So, so the presumption is half more stay on the floor and meat bags or something. You mean because there isn't enough seating for all of them to be at the table? Correct. Yes. I'm going to list the business. That's exactly right. And maybe it's not appropriate for this project, but what they've assumed here is that there's very few times when the entire class is receiving direct instruction all at once. And therefore, with aides or other adults in the space, that students are engaged in a number of different activities all at the same time. I think that's what you're seeing in this image. So does that change, Mrs. Cronin, does that change the, the need for additional staff in a multi-dynamic or type of learning environment? Or is the professional supposed to be able to juggle three different types of learning experiences? I think right now they're juggling three different types of learning experiences in a rectangle shaped classroom. So I think they're doing that kind of instruction, um, but in a facility that's built for different kinds of rows, like rows of kids facing a teacher. So it's happening. Yeah, very and is, is it fair to say that there's already multiple adults in most of the classroom environments? So this is the space just outside the classroom. Um, it was at the bottom of the diagram. So again, if you can imagine uh, specialists or aides or students that want to be acoustically separated from the classroom experience could be out in this experience. These, right, we've got gross motor activities going on over here. We've got a reading going on over there. And again, it's that demonstration of the variety. A similar expression to this, um, one from Wyoming. Here's what a grade level cluster looks like as a floor plan. Not all the classrooms are precisely the same shape, although they're similar in size. But the key feature is that there's this uh, town square, this commons, where students can move between uh, the classroom proper and the breakout space. And what's a little hard to depict is that each one of these skinny lines, that one, that one, right, in each one of the classrooms, is actually a glazed overhead garage door so that the teacher could choose the level of free flow between the two spaces and still be able to observe them. And this is what that looks like. So again, we've got a couple of different kinds of furniture. The furniture is designed to be pulled apart or pushed together into different group sizes. There's that um, glass overhead garage door where you could have the free flow of students between the two spaces. This is, these are essentially extensions of the classroom environment. Uh, same architect partnering with Fielding there out in Colorado. We show the entire floor plan because we're going to focus on this space right here. But I want you to notice that similar to many of the examples we've had, you know, we've got grade level grouping here of enclosed spaces with, you know, a small group room between them that all spill out into a shared common space. At the heart of the school, so here's a grade level, there's a grade level, there's a grade level. At the heart of the school is this thing that they're not calling library. It's a thing they're calling the learning center, the curiosity center. And it's an example where they've taken that idea of variety and uh, providing student choice into the library setting. So in this case, the flexibility comes from all of the stacks being on casters so that things like this can happen. Right? If a student's looking to carve out a quiet space, reading space for themselves, Perhaps they're choosing something where they've positioned the, the stacks as a, as a small alcove space, or they're using them as a divider from something that's much more large group in nature. There's some elevation change to signal that this is a place where we sit on the floor, and this is a place where we sit on furniture. So just a couple of different views of that. Again, this is, this is largely about student choice. How much is the sound? How much is the issue of sound? This, I mean, the pictures are very nice and staged, but if all these kids are in there, it's the first snowfall. It's all over. I, I suppose that's a, a fair argument. Um, there's also a large number of soft things in here to help with acoustics. Right? There's carpet in the space, there's a lot of soft furniture, it has a high ceiling, which helps with um, acoustics. Um, we don't, I don't know what the, it's like the ceiling is wide open. Um, but certainly acoustics are something that we have to think about all the time. And perhaps how this could be improved is by having some um, small and fully enclosed spaces as part of the library experience rather than it all being sort of uniformly open. Is that 
that was actually built. Yes, this is a built front. I don't know if you know or not, but so the different heights, different spaces are, are interesting. Did they build in accessibility to that particular I, space? Absolutely, yes. Yes. You can see the ramp in the next slide. Off from the upper right. Yeah, it's right. It's right. Has anyone ever done, <clears throat> sorry, any sort of post-mortem on all these innovative spaces as to whether or not they're actually being used as they were intended? Yes, they're all great designed and these are lovely stage photos, but are they actually being utilized as they were expected and as effective as they were expected to be? The short answer is yes. It varies district to district and architect to architect. Sometimes the district will do a post-occupancy evaluation of how spaces are being used. Sometimes the architect does a post-occupancy evaluation of how they're being used. For good or bad, architecture is one of those professions where you design something, you get all the input that you can, and then three years after the architect goes away, who knows how it's gonna be used, right? And your current buildings are a good example of that, right? So a successful project for us would be something that's flexible enough that you can actually change your mind over the course of the building's life cycle and not have to spend money reconstructing things. So this is Sunita Williams. This is one of our projects. It's uh, just up the road in Needham. And what we're trying to illustrate here is a different flavor of breakout space. Uh, so here you can see this is a great level cluster with four uh, classrooms, four classrooms. Rather than the breakout space be immediately between them, they were looking for something that was shared among two grade levels, a place where they could bring larger groups together and, and share that space. And so that's this right here. So what you're seeing in floor plan is some enclosed space, some open space, a large open area um, for a guest speaker or for movement activities. They're actually planning to build for Goldberg machines in this space. This is also a wet sciencey area. And then this is a reading structure, which you'll see in, um, in photographs in just a minute, with some specialists on the edges. So this is a blow up of that extended learning space. So you can see the variety of functions. Here's an open small group room. Here's an enclosed small group room where pull-out instruction with specialists is taking place. Um, this is a coach who's providing assistance to the faculty and staff in their, in their curriculum and delivery. And then we've got things like teacher collaboration and some, uh, some toilet infrastructure things sprinkled around. But this is what that space was conceived as during the design phase. That's a green pull-down green screen, uh, lots of dry erase surface. Here's that reading structure I mentioned. Here's that open floor gathering area. You're just seeing the science area, tabletop area, here in the foreground. And this is what that looks like in the built condition. Those of you who are going on the tour tomorrow will see this in action. And so I think one of you asked about accessibility before. Um, this was actually designed with sort of a universal design principle in mind, where this spot right here, students certainly choose to be there who are able-bodied, but it was designed so that someone in a wheelchair could roll in there and have the same experience as everyone else. There's the green screen, it turned out to be a permanent installation rather than a pull-down screen, but all of those functions you know, made their way all the way through the design process and into the built condition. So again, that was a, a very brief run through of some facility examples. So another opportunity for questions, then we're gonna do an exercise. Yep. Any remaining quick question, John? John. Uh, question: As far as with all that open space, is it easier to be energy efficient with these or not? So those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. High right. ceilings are much tougher to be down below. Well, the the ceilings in in many of these spaces are not any higher than they would be otherwise. Right. This is um, not quite a story and a half space. Um, the ceiling height in here is only 11 feet. Oh. Right. It's in this in this product. It's 14 feet floor to floor. So where the um, acoustical clouds are is only 11 feet. So it's not like it's a double height space. Yeah. Does it cost like um, more to create this type of space versus your traditional space? If so, what's the cost? I guess. So. 
anytime you add square footage to a project, it's going to add cost for sure. Right? The MSBA has now made provisions for things like these breakout spaces for them to be partially eligible for reimbursement. So but I guess the question I have is just in overall, I like just say, you know, they just say we have a, a room like this versus a room with textures and all of these corners and vents and stuff like that. What's the cost on, on average? Well, it, we, we don't, I'm going to sidestep that one for right now. We, we don't really know. We have, the MSB publishes data about what projects are costing in Massachusetts. And I think what they will tell you about cost is it doesn't matter what kind of space it is. By and large, what drives cost for these projects is the size of the project itself, the number of square feet. And so if it's a classroom versus a cafeteria, yes, there's a, a nominal difference between what those spaces cost. This has a long clear span, for example, in the structure. So that's going to be a little more expensive than if it was a classroom that was a little shorter span. But in terms of the grand picture, that's a relatively minimal cost difference in the grand scheme of things. Does that help? Yeah, but I guess I was looking more like, uh, you know, based on your experience, uh, would you say it's maybe a differential of 15%, 20%, you know, like some sort of rule of thumb that you can use to quickly calculate and do your analysis and, you know, in your experience? You mean for all of yeah, yeah, the like, you know, more like a that, that general, general. That data, that data does exist, but we don't know enough yet to tell you what that is for this specific of project. Course, of course, but I'm just saying in general. So I'm asking, you know, I'm not saying what is this for this, but I'm just saying what is overall giving the 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 plethoras of example that you show just so you don't have any of that information. Where Chin, do you wanna to respond to that? So, uh, my name is Chip and I'm with uh, Compass Project Management um, on the project. The the, the way for for the time being uh, the better way to think about it is, is, is that you're still going to be buying furniture. Okay? Whether you buy furniture that is movable versus more stationary, um, the delta is not enough for the time being to be really um, worried about it. Um, the, what drives the difference is that you say that you want a bigger gym, that will drive up the cost. Uh, the delta that we're looking at, as long as we're staying within the same square footage by the, at the end of the day, that at the moment, I would, the delta is not, we don't have enough information to be able to say that it actually costs more or less. Uh, because what you ended up doing is, is that you, you ended up trading one thing, uh, uh, the, the more open spaces is that more you have less cost. Just by, by nature, and then so that there, there's some. So it's not necessarily more expensive right now. But what would be more expensive if is if you build a bigger building? If just when would we have when this will be by June? When would we have a better idea? Of the We're gonna um, have some sort of cost estimates here in the PDP phase that will go in with the March submission. Uh, the, 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 I, I, I want to preface up that the PDP phase cost is more of a uh, that that one option is more expensive than the other because uh, we are building it, uh, um, one side has ledge and the other one does, for instance. Uh, so it's more on the, it, because that's not a detailed estimate. I just want to caution that. If the, if the question is about, if we had a traditional elementary school of 100,000 square feet, in a modern elementary school exactly. of 100,000 yeah. square feet, would they be any difference in cost? The answer is no. It doesn't cost any more to build a, a, an appropriate, contemporary, um, modern educational facility than it would to be a, build a traditional elementary school. Then why is the pitch then? I mean, you know, I mean, it seems like you guys are pitching this these type of modernized thing, but if, if there's no difference in the cost, I mean, you know, I guess I'm, I'm missing maybe I'm missing points here. I don't know that we're making a, a cost pitch. Are you saying that if there's no difference in terms of the cost of you know, the yep. traditional school, this new school, then I, I guess, I guess what's the what's the point of showing all these kids here? You know what I mean? Like, you know. good question. So the point is not everybody is familiar with what a, like a modern elementary school looks like. And so this is meant to be educational for the community, so that we can show you examples that it's not just 
you know, 30 rectangles strung along a, a corridor at a geomatic cafeteria and we're all done. If, if it's done properly, it would be much more than that, right? A much wider variety of spaces. Yeah, I also think we got a few comments out of the first session where people were saying, well, you know, this cafeteria looks fine. Why don't we just build this? Or, or we grew up in a classroom that was square. Why don't we have that classroom? So what we're trying to do here is explain to people like, like me, who grew up in these traditional classrooms, how teaching is different now, how students are learning differently now, so that when we show the design, when we come up with the final design of whatever the project is, people understand um, why it looks the way it does, and why it looks so different from how we grew up. And, and, and you know, to Jason's point, it's not really about cost. The cost will come up if we if we make a whole wall of windows. You know, that's expensive. If if you're looking at wooden built-in cubbies instead of sort of pre-made, that's expensive. So that's where the cost can drive up. But just building a, a basic traditional school exactly what Jason said, versus a modern school, those are going to be very similar costs. It's really going to come into the finishes. Um, and that's, you know, and we're very, trust me, we're very cost conscious. We know this is taxpayer money, and we're very, very sensitive about that. But what the point of this presentation is really just trying to explain to all of us, you know, what is what does teaching look like today, and how are these students learning? So it's not really about cost, it's more about that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So we're almost past eight, so maybe one more thing and we should get to ask yeah, So we have a number of images scattered around the room that are representative of sort of the full spectrum of the educational experience of the elementary grades. And so what we'd like you to do is um, engage in this I like, I wish, I wonder activity, where we've got some post-it notes sprinkled around, and we'd like you to look at the images and see you know, what you might be attracted to, what you think might be important for the project to consider. So the I like prompt, you know, use that as an opportunity to make a positive statement about something that you think maybe should be in the project. The example I gave there was, you know, I like the variety of spaces that's, that's represented in this image. Um, use the I wish prompt to express, you know, your vision for something. Um, and perhaps it's something that's not depicted, that, that we don't have an image of. And then use the wonder to sort of pose a question. We need some more information about something. Um, to the question earlier, I, you know, the example we gave is, I wonder if it must be able to reimburse for a slightly larger gymnasium. We already gave the answer to that particular question, but use that I wonder prompt as a way of sort of asking questions or, or for additional information. We've got about a half hour left, so maybe what we do is we do this for about 25 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, come back at 25 after and we'll share with you the next steps and then after everybody goes we'll compile all of this information just like we have with the other uh, public forum. Just before we close out, give you want to alert people to the design team's next steps. And we mentioned these briefly in the opening process slides, but we have a, a repeat of tonight's meeting on Thursday night. December and January of next year are about creating the options. In other words, synthesizing all of the information we've gathered so far, making a first pass at what the options look like for each one of those three scenarios that we described. In February of next year, we're going to start the cost estimating process and start the process to evaluate the options in an effort to uh, establish the short list for that uh, MSBA submission in March of next year. And then like we said, if everything goes according to plan next summer, around the time of the end of the school year, we'll have identified what the preferred solution is to submit that to the MSBA. So we're not taking the vote on funding next year. We're going through the process of going through the many, to the few, to the one. Any questions about that? Tony or Emily, do you want to close us out? Uh, yeah. So Two final quick things. Um, if you haven't already on your way out, if you could uh, sign in, that would be great. Um, I'll just reiterate, there is a great online resource that has all sorts of information, frequently asked questions, all the presentations. Um, so we, you know, we're trying to be as transparent and sharing as much information as, as possible. Um, and finally, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn this? I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right.
Good. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, everyone. Leave me hanging. Sorry. Don't mind me.